Hi, I'm Shiv. And I'm Chitra. We are the co-hosts of this show, Software People Stories. We are happy to bring you stories of people associated with software as makers or consumers. In every episode, we talk to people on their own personal and professional journeys, their interests and approach to work and life in a free-flowing conversational format. We hope that you will be able to draw your inspiration from their experiences and insights. These podcasts are made possible by PM Power Consulting, who have helped individuals, teams, and organizations on their delivery excellence journeys. Welcome to this episode of the Software People Stories. Today, I am in conversation with Victor Cezanne, an Agile coach based in Sweden. In his career, he has been a product owner, scrum master and Agile coach at companies such as Spotify, Avanza Bank, King and Nordic Entertainment Group. In this conversation, Victor shares his thoughts on how he got into software, his first startup even while he was at school starting as a content handler and becoming a product owner, understanding the challenges of working with remote teams, using feedback to improve one's style of working, how learning from others fueled his desire to share, and how he approaches coaching by first connecting with the organization or teams before starting a formal engagement. His experiment at Spotify of removing all managers the importance of empathy for a coach in a multicultural team about being sensitive to diversity in the team and since he has also been associated with India, his experience and impressions of working in Bangalore and being adventurous with food while in Mumbai. We also talk about the backstory behind his podcast, The Law of the Raspberry Jam. And finally, his thoughts on where we are headed in terms of agile in the enterprise and the role for coaches. Listen on. Hi, Victor. Welcome to this episode of uh, the Software People Stories. I am super excited to have this conversation after first knowing about you and some of the things that you've done. And we usually start with uh, the guest introducing oneself and then follow it on with a free flowing conversation. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And sure, um, my name is Victor. And I live in Sweden, uh, which is in the north of Europe. I work, I do coaching today, a coach of organizations, um, agile and teams. I've not been active so long, about 15 years. And I got into software development really just slipping on lots of banana peels um, by accident. That's, yeah. I, I f it started off that I, after high school, I, I've, started a startup or founded a startup we had a problem in sweden with uh, lots of kids had prepaid phone prepaid uh, sim cards mm -hmm. and they would run out of money okay. and I thought that, that was dangerous like what if you won't need to call someone mm -hmm. so we started as we created a startup and we solved that problem like you could always call home even if you didn't have money and you could always text your mom and dad even if you didn't have money and you know i thought i was going to be rich <laughs> <laughs> and obviously it didn't go that well way um, we we did have some offers to buy the company and if we would have taken them that would probably have gone well but we thought that you know we know best we can do this ourselves so me and my friend we we tried to make this work and we won some awards and grants but we just couldn't get enough customers to come in and so we couldn't take out salary and while we, while we were doing this i needed income so I took a job on the side and that job was uh, as a content manager or content handler for uh, Sony Ericsson's website. So I worked there for about six months. My, my, my thought was always that this would be something temporary. And then they outsourced to okay. India, to um, Bombay. And a lot of people, they left, a lot of the content handlers, they left because they saw this as, you know, I want to... It, they were professionals, they had a career, they just could move to somewhere else and get a, a better mm -hmm. job where there was stability and they were, uh, but I had no such ambitions, so I mm -hmm. stayed there. 
And eventually I turned content manager and I was working with a team in India. And as many companies did in, back then, people around the world, like stakeholders, they would have someone, a contact a person in the Western world. And then um, that's how they would express it. Like we want someone local to be the contact person and then you will have all the conversations with India. Yeah. So I got to know a lot of people uh, and I had a lot of empathy and understanding for the content handlers. Eventually, um, they would tell me like, this is what's not working for us. This is what aspects are, are bad. And I would tell the projects that were trying to improve. Um, so in Ericsson, I would tell them and, and like, you know, so here's, here's what a normal day looks like for a content handler. They could spend, you know, an hour just downloading files because they had so slow internet. Mm. Or since they had to use, you know, remote uh, Citrix solutions, they might have to wait 10 seconds after each click they had in our content management system. And when I spoke about these things and I talked about, you know, the experience from a content handler's perspective and, you know, I also combined that with monetary terms. Um, there was an agile coach who thought that, you know, you sound like a product owner. Mm. He tried to move me in towards the product owner role. And that's how I got introduced to agile. And that was, I guess, 10 years ago or something. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, from being a content person to getting into a product owner role where you had to work with developers and other technical people, how was that transition for you? It was, it was difficult. Not, I mean, I knew um, many developers socially. You know, uh, I was more social than I have today. I don't have that much time anymore unfortunately mm -hmm. but uh, so I know I, I knew a lot of people but I didn't understand the craft at all and um, the architect my team the one of the teams I was product owner for had an architect and uh, he he was very direct with me and taught me about what it's like to work with developers what it's like to work with uh, uh, what it's like to be a PO you know um, it was a it was a really difficult experience. Basically, everything I had a very project project management approach, and um, because that's how I had become uh, successful, you know, structure a reductionist, like breaking down tasks, ser uh, sequencing them, and I, I was the one doing it, uh, analyzing, etc. But here, so suddenly, the team is supposed to do that. So that was a huge shift for me. And the architect, he was not afraid of telling me where I was doing wrong. Um, okay. So it was, it was a little bit about understanding my role and the team's role and that the team is more important than me. That started there. And that was, that was a difficult journey for me. It, is, it had started earlier when one of the team members uh, in the team I was content manager for, she had given me feedback about uh, how I was very command and control and micromanaging as a manager. Oh, okay. And so that had already started a few, uh, about a year earlier. And then I'd taken some leadership training because I wanted to not be that way. Mm -hmm. I took it as a pretty strong signal, uh, seeing as I know what I knew about uh, the Indian culture back then was that it was unusual, unusual for directs to challenge and give their uh, managers feedback uh, mm -hmm. unsolicited. But she did. And I'm really grateful for that. Uh, but so, like, for me, there was two parts of this. One part was I'm not the most important and then also trusting the team. Yeah. So that was a huge learning curve for me. Hmm. So were these teams all co-located or distributed at the time when you were a PO? I had one co-located and then I had one, uh, well, both were co-located, but one was in Sweden and one was in India. Okay. Yeah. Okay. When did this transition or how did this transition to an agile coach happen? So um, after being a PO for some, for about a year, I'd been a content management manager uh, working in an organization, uh, like working with agile, pro uh, they call it agile projects. You know, that's some, yeah. So, and then um, I was a product owner and then I got a job as a, consultant but what that mostly meant was being either a scrum master or a PO and so mm -hmm. slowly gradually over time I learned more about 
both agile and both effective patterns. And I started noticing that for each new client that I started working with, my approach shifted a little bit from doing things myself to helping organizations do things themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I remember quite vividly that this is after this, I started uh, looking for agile coach uh, roles. Uh, I remember that I worked with one client and there they had BAs and they were, they had brought me in to be a PO. And I, I just thought, well, why do you need another person involved in your you know, value stream? And so I started helping people do the things that they expected me to do where they naturally fit. So the BA might, you know, create an overview of the coming month or month in terms of what, which of these work items, your work units are most important and why. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I started facilitating building relationships um, between people who needed to work with. So I didn't really do the job, the, the work myself. I just helped it become done more effectively. And after that, and I really liked it. Uh, I also noticed that I didn't carry work home with me as much after that. Oh. Uh, so it was also like a personal development thing that I could I could work less. I had worked a lot. I really loved to work. I still do, uh, but I also want to do other things in my life. Yeah. Uh, and up until then, I had wor- you know I'd traveled back and forth to lots of places. Uh, India mostly. I've been in Bombay and Bangalore, um, Kerala. You know, I'd been there maybe two or three times per year for many years. Oh. Um, so I was tired of that traveling aspect. But so, so it was bo- both like personally really relieving that I didn't have to do everything. Mm-hmm. And it was also really rewarding seeing an organization be really successful thanks to, you know, either if it's advice or feedback or tools that you provide them with. Good. How um, you mentioned as part of your ebook on the Avanza case study that now you wanted to share your experience. Now, what was the trigger for that? Um, I've, I have a, when I got started back in the day, maybe, you know, around 2008 or so, I mean, that's not back in the day for most people. That's just like even late. But for me, that was, <laughs> that was early, at least among my first early years. When I became a PO, I consumed a lot of content. What helped me develop was reading other people's experiences, having mentors, having people to talk to, attending Lean Coffee. There's a lot of content out there today. There's, in fact, so much that it's overwhelming. Mm. But I think there's very little content on coaching organizations in non-predetermined ways, just, you know, meeting them where they are and uh, helping them develop from there based on their goals. And so I wanted to be a positive force in spreading new patterns. Um, mm. And I've, I've been blogging for, I don't know, now maybe it's six years or so, five or six years. Mm. I've been blogging for quite some time. So I, I, I really believe in that, like if we can share, the more we can share, the, the faster the industry can develop and the better people will feel at work and the more effective, uh, successful companies will be. Yeah, so it's that would be it. Like, I really care about people being successful. Hmm. Not that my approach is what is success, but maybe I can spark some thinking on, oh, this is, I really like this part. I'm going to try it. Or, oh, I did not like this. However, if we modify it this way, it might work. Yeah. So this is probably somewhat related to uh, your podcast, one of the recent episodes on uh, coaching teams that don't want to be coached. As a coach, when you get into an organization, how do you establish that connect so that you can help them? So we need to look at different systems then. If we look at the company as a system and then we can look at the teams as a system. Let's leave the team part for later because usually when I'm taken into, where I'm, when I'm brought in or asked to join a company, I'm asked to help out an organization. And I start i enter that system before i formally join and we have a contract Mm -hmm. i i prefer to spend uh, at least a month or a couple of months getting to know the management Mm -hmm. team or the managers we explore their goals their pain points you know what's behind the goal and we we just have these informal casual conversations 
where I also share my thoughts. Like, and if I'm able to be helpful without us entering a contract, like, that's great. Uh, you know, I've been helpful. I've learned something and I have a great relationship. If it's something big that requires coaching or something else that I can help out with, that's great too. Now we know. And then I've entered the system before I've efficiently entered it. And that's great because then we have a collaboration working. But many times I've noticed that the companies, they actually don't want or need coaching. They need other okay. things. Mm. And so we can, f we find that out in our conversations and they're really happy because they save a lot of time and uh, time, energy and money mm. uh, by not bringing in a coach. So recently I was brought in or yeah, uh, and I had a conversation with a company, a small company and uh, they have coaches and managers and we, um, we winded up talking instead about different patterns that their coaches and their managers can collaborate in rather than bringing me in. And that was super helpful to them and oh, to that's me. nice yeah. yeah and that's from a couple of conversations but if it wouldn't have been successful then i might have joined right and mm -hmm. um so that's how i get i i put the company's goals at the center mm -hmm. uh, and we spend some time with that now in terms of teams i try to do the same okay. and a lot of it is about facilitating early on it's about facilitating congruence or openness maybe so the team needs to really understand the situation they are in but so does the like the the context or the management or stakeholders they really also need to understand so mm -hmm. what is what in this situation is the coachable aspect and is everyone in agreement about that and if they're not that's where i spend my time before i start coaching okay. and so i spend a lot of time with the permissioning and the building collaborative contracts mm. Interesting. One analogy that you mentioned when we started the conversation is about the banana peels that you learned from. Yeah. Uh, you want to share some of those? In hindsight, probably they're funny, but I'm sure it should have been uh, quite a learning experience at that time. So we had one thing that happened uh, while at Spotify was we had a, we ran an experiment where we removed all the managers mm -hmm. and everyone said, we don't want managers. And mm -hmm. So this introduced me a little bit to holacracy, sociocracy, and I looked at patterns uh, from okay. there. But so we don't want managers. We don't trust managers. Managers are bad. That was mm. basically the sentiment. And we had the situation where we needed to recruit managers, but we also had a situation where we needed more individual contributors, so developers, mm. sys, uh, sysadmins, etc. So we were faced, and uh, we were faced with like, do we bring in managers that's going to require six to twelve months to get started, get, get started, uh, build relationships, and be able to make an impact and restore faith in management, or do we spend all of our budget on employing or building larger teams? So we offload yeah. team members, and we 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 went for that. We said that we would. Um, Instead, we would use all of our, uh, we would invest more in bigger, building big, bigger teams, uh, which is something that the teams really liked. And they okay. said that, oh, that's great. We want that. And we want to take on more uh, leadership responsibilities. And uh, so that's one way I slipped into like uh, flatter organizations, solocracy and sociocracy. Obviously, our experiment, we learned a lot. During that, like now in hindsight, it's, yeah, sure, I might try to do that again, but mm -hmm. we would probably build structures uh, and train people before we made the transition. And here we did it the other okay. way. So we removed the managers and then we started training people. Mm -hmm. And that, that was really, that created a lot of tension. So, um, but that was also like, we had the situation. How do we deal with it? How do we, it's just, this is our daily life. Like, how do we deal with this situation? Well, mm -hmm. let's look at patterns. Uh, okay. And yeah, so that's one way of slipping. Um, I mean, I have loads of other ones uh, about s slipping. There are two types of slipping, just slipping because it's uh, fun and oh, just incidental, but then also slipping because it's really challenging. Yeah. And I think I have more of the challenging ones yeah to share. Um, feedback is another example where I was, uh, I was really stressed by the, uh, an organization I was working in. I'd always been praised before this for my ability to take and deliver feedback, but this was a really stressful environment. And the feedback I got was also, you're not good at taking feedback, hmm. which really didn't match my identity. 
Uh, but it was true, right? It was it was true that in this environment, I had a hard time accepting, listening, hearing feedback. And mm-hmm. so that li- brought me on to just consuming loads of material about feedback, which mm. led me to creating feedback trainings and uh, feedback blog posts and feedback models. So that was also something that I, I use a lot thanks to that situation. But it, that was also uh, slipping in a challenging time. Yeah. Yeah. You also mentioned uh, earlier when you had to work with the team in Mumbai yeah. about having empathy for them. Yeah. So as a coach, how do you blend the different cultural expectations or needs with having something that is common across the team, which is probably located in multiple cultures when it is not a monoculture that is? Yeah. Um most teams I work with nowadays are n- not monocultures. Okay. Uh, but back then, it was a foreign concept to me uh, because mm. most cultures were uh, monocultures. Um, and back then, I didn't spend too much time. Well, I mean, it wasn't it was a monoculture because I, it depends on how you see it, right? So the team in India, they were you know male and female, and you had people of different ages. Uh, the youngest was maybe 19 and the oldest was, you know, around 40. Uh, mm-hmm. And people had their different beliefs and faiths. Um, so, but, you know, everyone came from India, but you, India is so big that you, right. you cannot just encapsulate everything and just, oh, it's India. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot of diversity in that team from one perspective. But, you know, if yeah. you're from Sweden and you don't know a lot, that's just one mm-hmm. monoculture. But I didn't spend a lot of uh, time on... Uh, building or like uh, I didn't spend a lot of time on diversity okay 15 years ago today I just I spend a, I do spend time on honoring differences and seeing like how do we relate to them which ones can we use in our favor um, mm-hmm. and just having people be aware of the differences in the diversity and celebrating it um, through different exercises it could be as easy as just talking about what do we have in common what do we not have in common and um, how do we relate to that that could be one thing but so today i spend i spend much more time on diversity than i used to but because i wasn't aware of it back then i didn't really suffer from it or i i didn't i didn't see how i didn't see how it it was negative to not focus on it Mm -hmm. so do you have any um, interesting story or an interesting memory from your visit to bangalore and i'm switching Topic since you mentioned Bangalore, I couldn't not ask you. Um, oh, interesting. I, I don't know. Interesting. I, I <clears throat> From your perspective. Yeah. yeah I mean, uh, I really, so I really enjoyed uh, working in Bangalore. Uh, I really liked the, this was quite a while ago and I can imagine it's really different now than it was back then. But I really enjoyed the, how the city merged or like merged with nature. Um, mm-hmm. If I compared it to Bombay, which I'd been in uh, before that, or um, there was mostly like city. There wasn't mm-hmm. a lot of greeneries. But in, uh, in Bangalore, they, they had these you know, hundreds of year old trees mm-hmm. growing in the streets. And you could also feel this in the air. Uh, the air was really clean, especially compared to uh, Mumbai. So I, I remember walking on the streets on the mornings and uh, just feeling how wonderful the air was and the energy was. I really liked, or still like, uh, Bangalore. It's one of those places where I felt that <laughs> the energy of the city matched my, my own personal energy. Um, but when I was in Bangalore, I'd been in India so many times that there was, uh, I didn't really see the magic of the city uh, it, it, it had become work moving to going to uh, India for me um, but I mean a funny story from Mumbai is the first time I went there I was like oh I you know I want to eat I want to try the local food so I just went to a hotel and I and I said oh I I couldn't read what was on the menu so I just pointed on two things and I ate it and there was no <laughs> tourist there and I said oh look there's a lot of people locals eating at this place it's obviously really good yeah. And so I went there and I ate and, you know, it was amazing. Um, 
And uh, then I went back to the work and they said, where did you eat lunch? And I said, here. And they're like, oh no, you cannot eat there. Why not? Well, you're a Westerner and you cannot eat there. You're going to get sick. And I didn't get sick. Um, oh, that's not good. <laughs> on my 10 journeys, I only, I think, uh, had fever once. I mean, I, I and I, my thing was really try to explore as much of your cuisine as possible. But I did get lots of looks from hotels when I went in there and from other people. Like, what, what is this? He's going to get sick. But yeah. yeah. Since uh, we also talked about your uh, interest in sharing. Yeah. Uh, we want to talk about uh, you know, your podcast. Some of our listeners could know more about it and then can I listen to your episodes as well? Yeah, so the podcast has really changed form from what we thought we would do it initially. Um, when we started, the, the, the podcast started as a book idea. We okay. wanted to write, we wanted to interview lots of different people around the world um, who people would consider thought leaders or just like influencers within organization mm-hmm. or agile. We wanted to talk to them about where is the future heading? And so mm-hmm. we thought that, what about it? What if we create a book? We, we let these people write a chapter each. But that became really diff, difficult from a logistics and planning perspective. So then we thought, why don't we interview these people? Hmm. And that became difficult uh, because, like, how you, you need video interviewing and people are around different time zones and quality and editing, etc. Um, but the idea was still like, oh, we want to talk about where is, uh, where is Agile heading? Hmm. And then someone, uh, a friend of ours, uh, suggested, why don't we do a podcast and we interview one person per, uh, per episode. And so we tried that, but we had a really hard time with getting audio quality good because not everyone sits in like these isolated sound uh, rooms with great microphones over great connections. And so eventually we said, well, let's just share the because Esther and I, we were having these great conversations every month and we have been for quite some time now we say what mm. if we just record them and publish them mm. so it's it's basically just what do we talk about when the cameras are not on but we just mm-hmm. put them on that's kind of what our uh, yeah. and, and, but because it's um because we publish them we do need to polish them and we are polish them polishing them a little bit mm-hmm. but yeah so that's the idea or was the idea and when how it uh, turned out mm. yeah i like the format it's crisp takes a particular problem because we also talk about uh, what we call that's more than a blog format called a chow or a challenge of the week yeah uh, many many coaching situations that we come across we just present it as a small situation mm-hmm. and then a couple of weeks later also share some perspectives on how it can be approached yeah mm-hmm. yeah that that's kind of that's kind of how we that's that's definitely resonates with me hmm. how do you see the role of a coach going forward as organizations adopt agility and on the other side agile is getting kind of commoditized um yeah i think that i'm seeing this anti uh, or this i'm seeing movement towards um stopping to use well i'm seeing oscillation happen so some companies uh, usually the companies that were early on adopting agile they are exploring other ways of dealing with uh, this rather than coaches and i think that's great Mm. Um, i do not believe in a model where you have integrated coaches in all the teams permanently i believe that's a organizational design flaw Mm -hmm. um if you always, yeah, I, I, so I, I, I think that some, but there's a huge uh, tail and I'm visualizing this with my hand. So you have some companies that haven't even started using coaches and that have never used coaches mm-hmm. and those companies, they are probably, and that's, I don't know where we are on the adoption curve from a uh, global perspective, but I don't think that we are past their early majority or late majority. So I, mm-hmm. I, I think uh, coaches have a really nice future ahead of them if they want to you know make a career for themselves but in terms of what's going to be helpful i don't think that having embedded coaches is the answer to everything yeah and so we're gonna i think we're entering a new era now of patterns where holacracy and sociocracy is going to be much more um, prevalent and in that there are no agile coaches they might Mm -hmm. be holacracy coaches and so Mm -hmm. 
many, I think, agile coaches are going to reschool themselves, and then some mm-hmm. coaches are going to just shift roles to something else, whether that's uh, PM or uh, you know uh, dev management roles. Mm-hmm. I think is yeah. Mm. yeah, that's a very interesting perspective, uh, which is both positive that there is something that agile coaches can do, and if one is not reskilling, one is not empathetic to the environment. I guess one needs to seriously reconsider reskilling. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's about all the time we have for uh, this episode. Thanks a lot, Victor. I'm I do have more questions, and I'm sure some of our listeners also might have. So yeah. we may, yeah. you know, want to have one more conversation on some of the topics that you mentioned. Particularly, holacracy is definitely generating a lot of curiosity. So it would be my th- yeah. Thanks for having me here. It would be my pleasure. And yeah, just. If we don't have, uh, I mean, if you have questions between that time, um, just feel free to shoot me an email. Yeah, definitely. If uh, you don't mind, on the show notes, we'll also share your contact details. So if somebody wants to reach you directly, they could do that. That would be absolutely fine. Thanks a lot, Victor. Thank you. If you like the show and would like to share your experiences with the community or know someone else who might want to do that, please get in touch with us at podcast at pm-powerconsulting.com. That is podcast at pm-powerconsulting.com. Please rate the show on Podchaser, Stitcher, iTunes or any other podcast client that you find us on. Please also share our episodes with your friends and others in your network. If you or anyone you know would like to be featured on our show, do write to us at this email address, podcast at pm-powerconsulting.com.